Are you working for a distributor? Or maybe you're in the distilled spirits manufacturing game, and now you're looking to expand your spirits business industry knowledge in order to work better with other distilling companies. Well, if you want to leg up on the competition, you need to take a look at the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. This is a six-course online program, and it's going to prepare you for everything on the business side of the spirits industry, things like marketing, finance, and operations. And it's also 100% online, so you can access the courses at any time and anywhere. So go to uofl.me slash bourbonpursuit to learn more. The Meltdown Ice Ball Press is engineered differently because it doesn't use any pins. The top cover rides down grooves built into the base, and after about a minute, your block of ice is turned into a perfect sphere, and you can sit there and ooh and ah at all the melted water that drips down the side. It's a really satisfying thing to watch. Learn more at MeltdownIce.com. If you're looking to upgrade your sleep, do it today with a bare mattress. You're guaranteed to get the proper back support, pressure relief, and comfort or your money back. Every Bear Mattress is proudly made in the USA and comes with two free pillows. Try the top-rated Bear Mattress risk-free for 100 nights. You can learn more at bearmattress.com slash bourbon. That's B-E-A-R mattress.com slash bourbon. Bill always wanted to help bourbon. Exactly. Not just Maker's Mark, because he always felt like what's good for Bourbon is always going to be good for Maker's Mark. This is episode 289 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start getting into a little bit about Maker's Mark history, here's your weekly bourbon news update. A few weeks ago, we reported about the TTB approving new bottle sizes, including the 700 ml, which is a standard for exports that we see to the European Union. Now, I made a prediction on the first roundtable this year that we likely won't see a huge shift because of the bottling and marketing process and even some of the upstream things that happen at the distribution layer. Well, I'm beginning to start backpedaling on those words a little bit. Last week, I had a discussion with Chris Hart of Whiskey Need on another podcast, and Now there's a new Daily Beast article that talks about this may happen at a much quicker rate than I anticipated. Even with 50 milliliters less in the bottle, you will likely not see a price shift for the product being cheaper. So be prepared that a shrinking package size doesn't actually mean a shrinking price. Maggie Kimbrell, a content editor for American Whiskey Magazine and also our guest way back on episode seven, has been selected as the new president of the Bourbon Women Association. Congrats, Maggie, and we look forward to seeing more out of bourbon women this year. Now, moving on to bourbon release news. MGP has announced the release of its 2021 Rossville Union Single Barrel Program, with this year's series including three different mash bills and also a cash train. Bottled annually, Rossville Union Single Barrel Straight Rye ships to each participating retailer by August of 2021, which is also National Rye Month. A new company called Coalition Whiskey has partnered with Kentucky artisan distillery Steve Thompson and veteran winemaker Ludwig Vanneron to create some new ryes finished in three different Bordeaux wine barrels. There are three different rye expressions, and pardon me, I may mess this up a little bit. Rye finished in Margot Barriques at 90.8 proof, finished in Pollock Barriques at 92.6 proof, and finished in Sauternes Barriques 94.2 proof. In addition, Coalition will also offer bottles of their original rye-based whiskey at Barrel Proof, which is 108.8 proof. Now for today's podcast, we get to take a trip down memory lane. Greg Walker joins the show to talk about some of the inside stories about the history at Maker's Mark. Maker's Mark is an iconic brand, but it always wasn't that way. Greg was one of those initial hires at Maker's Mark, and he helped Bill Samuels Jr. turn it into the global brand that it really is today. Barrel Bourbon Batch 26 is now available, featuring a selection of 9, 10, 11, 13, and 15-year-old barrels, taken through several blending steps and bottled at 112.64 proof. And it has a suggested retail price of $90. You can go to BarrelBourbon.com right now to learn more, and you can also order online. Remember, if you like the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Our community now has over 900 people just like you helping support the show, and we would love to have you join us. So enjoy today's episode, and now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. 
I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Uh, this week's idea comes from Nick Kolinsky. I hope I said that right, Nick. Uh, Nick writes me on fredminnick.com about holiday raffles. I frequent a few stores, he writes, and I recently won a raffle at a big store. I probably shouldn't have. I'm in pretty good with the manager. However, I didn't win at a small store that I most certainly should have. I visit them two to three times a week. Do store owners or managers benefit from the regulars winning, or do they run an honest raffle to win new customers? Do they fear that their regulars will just sell the allocated bottles? Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is a very important issue that we could actually tackle this probably on a Bourbon Pursuit roundtable. But essentially what we're looking at here is we're, we're looking at the question, what is the integrity of these raffles? And you have to remember that these raffles, anything that has to do with a name being drawn out of the hat, it is actually regulated by state governments. So if somebody is up to shenanigans, they could face some penalties. And this is one of the reasons why people don't do sweepstakes. People often ask me, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Because there's so many state laws that govern it. And by the way, if you do a raffle in California, I mean, if you screw that up, you're going to be giving away your firstborn and their firstborn. I mean, all of these laws in various states really are restrictive. So you'll see like these like uh, Caribbean cruises will have uh, drawings and sweepstakes all the time, but they don't do California. Anyway, that's a, that's a sidebar for another time. But I think it's really, I think most of these things are on the up and up. And I think these, these stores really do try to do it right. And there's no right way to do, you know, some of these allocated bourbons. I mean, you talk to these store owners and they feel like it's a curse more than it is a blessing. So, you know, I really feel for the stores. And uh, I think most of the time, I, I've not seen anyone who really does anything that's not on the up and up. I mean, it may feel that way sometimes because you don't get a bottle uh, on a raffle, but but it's not. Now, it might be a better method for them to give it to their their best um, you know customers uh, like you, Nick, uh, that, that you felt like your regular store should have given it to you. I think that's probably the better way to do it, and it definitely sustains customer relations in the long run. But in general, I don't really have an opinion on these raffles. I kind of feel bad for the liquor stores and having to deal with all that crap. But at the end of the day, that's where we are in bourbon today, and... I wish you all the very best in standing in line and getting into that raffle. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Thank you, Nick, for this week's idea. If you have an idea for Above the Char, make sure you hit me up on fredminnick.com and send me a note. We print them out every week. And I, as you see, I have my own raffle process, and I will read your questions. Until next week, cheers. And we're back with an episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Fred and, here today, Fred and Kenny here today. I was about to say Fred and I, but people don't, if they haven't listened to me before, they, they have no idea. Oh, everybody knows who you are, Kenny. Kenny Coleman. Well, you know, we're trying to be the, he's the biggest the, and best bourbon podcast he's, out he's there. He's the newest model for uh, for Beachbody.com. Yeah. I, just learned, I just learned today that you're a, you're a Beachbody guy. I love it. I, I'm just trying to stay fit. You know, the when everything was going on with COVID, I, I looked at it and I was just like, eh, well, the scale's looking a little weird. Let's go ahead and do something about it, so... It's funny. A lot of people look to bourbon and saying, like, how can I drink more of that? <laughs> and you have all the bourbon in the world and you went to Beachbody. Well, so I applaud you for that. And it's funny because people are all like, yeah, how do you work out and drink bourbon? I was like, actually, I, I balance it pretty well. It's surprisingly enough. It's, uh, you know, a, a, a pour one or once or twice a night. It doesn't really seem to affect me that now, much. Have you ever worked out after like having like five or six drinks? It's it's very very hard. You get worn out pretty quickly. Yeah, I've I've tried doing it, and I've even tried doing it after a barrel pick, and it <laughs> it doesn't work out very well. Like three quarters of the way through, you're like, okay, I think I'm done here. When I was in the army, there were times that we would stay out all night and uh, go to formation the next day, and you know there'd be guys hurling over there and hurling over there, and then we'd run six miles, <laughs> and then rug five, and it's like. I don't know how I did that, you know, <laughs> not the smartest idea, but no, we made it through, but you were, we were young then. So.
And for today's podcast, it's going to be pretty interesting to talk, you know, our, our guest today, Fred has actually known him uh, closely for a while. I had a chance to kind of talk to him a little bit mm -hmm. before we started recording. It's a very interesting background. And today is really going to be focused on a lot of the growth and the surge of Maker's Mark in the 90s to kind of how it became this massive, iconic brand to what it is today. Yeah, well, our our guest is the first, um, you know, basically the first sales rep for for Maker's Mark outside of like you know the Samuels family, and um, I mean he was he was out there hustling on the pavement, you know, pushing to get uh, Maker's Mark become a household name, and he's got a lot of good juicy stories too, which I hope he shares some of them, but I, he might still be under an NDA on a few. <laughs> uh, we'll see what we can pull out, right? And then he gets like, and then he evolves into. Uh, the chain restaurant business, which, you, you know, if you if you walk into chain restaurants and you've ever wondered how they got like a small distiller uh, or like a, a, a unique liqueur, you know, our guest might have been behind, um, you know, Chili's back bar. Like I remember going into Chili's and like, wow, they got their own barrel pick program. I mean, you know, so um, either Greg or someone like him would have been behind that. And chain restaurants, man, they represent a good chunk of eating out today. Oh, yeah. And I think uh, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later in the show. So let's go ahead and introduce our guest. So today we have Greg Walker. Greg is the owner of, well, Greg Walker Beverage Management. And he, as Fred was mentioned, he was also one of the first salespeople ever hired by Makers Mark and became the director of sales when he was just 35 years old. So Greg, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's uh, It was a long time ago. But uh we're yeah. gonna jog some of those memories today. Well, yeah, it was it was interesting. The uh the, the first guy that they hired was a guy named Jimmy Khan. Um and he was there Khan C O N N, yeah. He was there for uh for 23 years. And he was uh, you know, the southern gentleman, you know, a, a real a refined guy. He kind of he had the goatee, the white goatee, and uh he kind of looked like a uh, uh a debonair Colonel Sanders. Nice. And, yeah, he was around. He was a thespian a graduate from Vandy, and so he could really command a room. He was he was really hard to follow, but uh, but he was a good guy, and uh, and somebody yeah, else. So I was the second guy. It was kind of like following John Wooden. So uh, it was it was tough, but uh, a little but bit it of was pressure. Little yeah, pressure. exactly, exactly. So one of the things we've been doing this season is kind of starting everything off with a random icebreaker, just so folks get to know you and maybe us a little bit more. So. Yours today is you have to sing karaoke. What's oh, your no. song pick? Well, um, I used to work for Jack Daniels, and I had to go to Malaysia one time, and the guy picked uh, "Country Roads" by John Denver for me, and I had to sing it, and it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I could do it again. <laughs> How about you, Fred? You a big karaoke person? Well, there's one song I can nail, uh, and it's one that it's very hard to sing, but because I do like uh, I do auctioneering, um, sold by John Michael Montgomery, I I just have always uh, I've always been able to to sing that one. So I'd get up there, and people are like, "Oh my God, you can sing this!" Like, yeah, but I can't sing much more, <laughs> much more than that. See, I can't sing at all, and I'm probably going to represent the people of my generation here because. It's always like, you know, we'll let the we'll let the kind of the rowdy crowd go first, maybe the 80s heavy metal people. And then at some point it turns over to rap. And that's more like for me, like Warren G's regulators. Like nice. I can I can do regulators. That's nice. one thing I actually know every word to. So like I said, just uh growing up in the the 90s with the rap there, it's just something that always stuck. That's a me. good one. But you know, there's always that one guy who's like, you know, he's got uh He's got long hair and he's kind of sitting back there in the corner. He's waiting for his name to get called. Then he starts singing. You're like, holy shit. He just, right. good. He just right. kills it. He just kills it. I know. And it's like he and he's like, no one knows him. He just shows up everywhere in all the karaoke bars. Yeah. I had some buddies call me up uh, a couple of months ago and we went out to checks. And uh, they have karaoke night on Thursday night. And man, some of the people were really good. It was really a lot of fun. Talk about intimidation when you definitely when you go to a karaoke bar and people up there and they're they're like I said, they've got they can carry a tune, they right. know all the words. They practice. Yeah, they <laughs> practice and you're like, Well, I'm just like five drinks deep, I'll go for it. <laughs> right. And I've noticed that sometimes when you're really, really bad, you get more support. Mm -hmm. You know, so people are like, Man, it's all right, you got it. It's gonna be all right. <laughs> you're like, oh, well, hi. <laughs> All right, let's switch to talk about whiskey a little bit more. So, Greg, let's let's kind of roll back just a little bit before 
you were going into Maker's Mark? Because we were talking that uh, you actually started working for Brown Foreman out of the gate out of college, right? Yeah. So um, I got in the liquor business in college. Um, I graduated from college in 1980 from UK. And uh, yeah, if you remember 1980, you guys are too young to remember it, but um, it was double digit unemployment, double digit inflation. So times were bad. So I, and, and the freshman girls were coming in. So I said, well, I'll just stick around and go to graduate school, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I needed a job to put me through it. So I ended up working for Shoppers Village Liquors in Lexington, which became Liquor Barn later, uh, the Rosenstein family and um, worked there for three years while I was in grad school. And then, um, Retail retail liquor is tough. I mean, it's really hard. You're on your feet all the time. You're there late at night. Uh, it's a tough business. And I would I would watch the distributor reps come in, and, and they would come in, and they would you know do the shelves and take the orders and maybe build a little display. They're in 45 minutes, and they were gone. And I thought, well, that's that's better than what I'm doing. I'd like to be a distributor rep. But then the supplier reps came in, and they had a company car, expense account. And and it was like party time when those guys came in. I'm like, that's, that's the way I'm to go. Let's, that's let's, right. let's skip the distributor step and just move straight exactly, into the supplier. Exactly. So um, the Brown Foreman guy was a guy named Jim Ledan, and he was uh, had state of Kentucky. And I met him, and he said, "Well, when you graduate, come down. You know, let's interview you." So I I went down to uh, to Louisville from Lexington and and interviewed with him. And they said, "Now we move people around a lot. Are you okay with that?" I'm like, "Yeah." I'm 24 years old, like everything I own, I could throw in my car. And they said, well, if you can move anywhere, where would you want to go? And I looked out the window, it was February and it was snowing. And I looked back at them and I said, Florida. <laughs> and two months later, I'm driving down to Florida. And uh, so that's how I started with Brown Foreman. So I started in, like in, in South Florida with those guys. I, my, I was a, a merchandising rep. You just go into the liquor accounts, you pull out bottles and build cases and displays and put up displays. I had Vero Beach to Key West, Florida. I had, you know, a company, like, a sh- like a terrible territory. I had a company car. I had, you know, an expense account. I was 24 years old and I was like, that was probably the best part of my life. <laughs> it just wow. doesn't get any better than that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I did that. Then I, I worked in, uh, I got transferred to Mississippi, um, worked for a guy there named Tom Callahan, who was a St. X boy um, in, in Western Kentucky. Worked there for him for a couple of years. I was in Chicago uh, as a uh, assistant to the regional sales director there for a couple of years, and then came back to Louisville and started working there. Uh, had a couple of different jobs, new new products. I worked on a product called Earl Grey English Liqueur, which was the first product um, Brown Foreman put out in 18 years. So they did one called Frost 880, which was just like a corn whiskey. Well, that you was the, heard of yeah, it? No? yeah, that was the light whiskey that they wouldn't. It, like if you mentioned it in the hallways, you'd get fired. Yeah, well, that's what, that's what happened. They went down the hall and fired everybody. So when they came up with the new product, nobody wanted to work on it, right? And they said, Greg, if you'll work on it, we promise we won't fire you if it's a bomb. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it then. So it was a bomb. <laughs> 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 and uh, and I worked on that. And then I worked on Icy Vodka. I don't know if you guys remember Icy Vodka. I do not. Well, Icy Vodka. I, I don't know if you know this, but my uh, vodka, you know, background's not very good. I don't recall the Icy Vodka. You know, Icy Vodka was, you know, Absolute was killing it at the time, right? So Icy Vodka was from Iceland. It was the cleanest environment in the world. And that's where Icy Vodka came from. Unbeknownst to us in the marketing department, the production department was buying it from uh, MGP and shipping it to Iceland and bottling it there, then shipping it back to the U S so fucking spirit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right? so you just can't get away from the bullshit. Can you? I, I mean, we were talking <laughs> earlier, right? For the, we we're saying like a lot of it's just marketing BS. Right. Mm-hmm. And so there's a perfect example. So that, that brand died. So they said, we got to put him on a brand he can't kill. Right. <laughs> so they put me on Jack Daniels. And I worked on Jack Daniels in export markets. And that time, as we were talking earlier, uh, there was just domestic and export. I mean, everything mm-hmm. outside the U.S. was was export. And Jack Daniels had kind of reached a, a three million case mark at that point. This is in 1990. They had reached the uh, three million case point, and they were looking to expand to other markets, foreign markets, to grow the brand. And everything overseas was was. Um, uh, they loved American stuff. They didn't necessarily like Americans, but they liked American stuff. So they liked Levi Jeans. They loved Harley Davidson. They loved Jack Daniels. 
And so a lot of it was just filling the pipeline. But in those four years, we went from 900,000 cases to uh, a million and a half cases uh, just uh, in the five years that I worked on that brand. So yeah, there. So uh, we did. I did that and then went over to Maker's Mark after that, 90. Four is when I wanted to make. No, that was at a time that Maker's Mark was kind of like throwing pop shots at Jack Daniels. It's like you know, like you had Bill Samuels like hiring the Jack Daniel You're band. Exactly right. Yeah, and you had like him taking full page ads out of. Uh, he found the guy actually named Jack, Jack Daniels, Daniels down in Mississippi. Down in Mississippi, yeah. had him dress up in Jack Daniels garb. Yeah. Said, hey, look, everybody, Jack Daniels loves Maker's Mark. Right, right. <laughs> he was. It was great because we had one. Um, it was he, they Jack Daniels had they were trying to expand their life product cycle right and so they had come out with Jack Daniels beer um, and makers put out a billboard it was a six pack of beer with the wax on it and underneath it said never happen <laughs> and it, it it would Bill just like to kind of stick him he was kind of like the mosquito in the tent you know I mean he would yeah. just like to to have some fun and, I, and my doctor at that time was Dan Varga who was Paul Varga's oh, yeah, brother yeah yeah Paul he later became CEO of Brown Foreman. But I, I was at the doctor and Dan comes into my, into the, into the room there and he sees me and he just doubled over laughing. He goes, they are so pissed off over at Brown Foreman. He can't, they can't see straight. He was just rolling laughing. So yeah, that's, that's exactly what was happening during that time. And it was just Bill having some fun and, and just trying to promote the brand. Uh, he was, Bill was really, um, he, he, it was all about having a good time, being a little irrelevant or, or not irrelevant, but irreverent and, um, and just kind of, um, telling a story. And so that's what, that's what he did. And he did a really nice job of that. Did they poach you to come over too? Uh, no, I was, um, I was between jobs and, um, and so there was a agency called, um, uh, it was Al Oliver. Uh, he's out. He had a, a a big white building out off Lagrange Road, and that was the agency they used to recruit people. So um, I left Brown Foreman. Yeah, they 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 let me go. <laughs> they showed <laughs> me the way door. To put it. Yeah, that's right. They showed me the door. Thanks for the uh, five years of growth with Jack. Uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah. You know. Well, it, you know, it was like, and I don't want to get too personal, but it was like, okay, I grew my brand like uh, six hundred thousand cases, and the Southern Comfort guy lost. 300,000 cases and he got promoted and I got fired. It's like, I don't think we're basing this on results. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but it, it all worked out at the end and I still have a lot of good friends at Brown Forum and I still get a pension from them and I'm, I'm drink Woodford last night. So, you know, I, it, I, there's no hard feelings. A lot of, a lot of good memories. There. Yeah. Did you have, when you uh, went on, so one of the things about Maker's Mark and Bill Samuels is that he is famous for like having this personality test for people that would come That's on. That's right. Did you take the personality test? You had to take the personality test. I mean, that was like the door opener, right? So the Oliver Group sent you the personality test. It's, it's a two-pager, right? And it lists maybe 50 or 100, I forget, uh, different um, things, um, you know, like aggressive, uh, passive, um, uh, gregarious, patient, non-patient, you know, different things. And you would check which ones you were. You didn't know anything, right? You just said, if that's you, check it. If it's not you, don't check it. And you send it in. It's, it was called the predictive index, and they had done it back in the 50s. It measured four different um, personality traits. So the first one was your A factor, measured your, um, your, your ability to start up, to think through things. They drop you off in the woods. Uh, they come back a month later and you're subsistence farming and you've had a, you know, you've dammed up and you're, you have fish and, you know, the shelter and you're doing the whole thing, right? If you're a low A, you're still sitting there waiting for somebody to tell you what to do, right? So is your, you know, how, how much of a self-starter, how aware are you to get things done? Your B factor was your gregariousness. C factor was your uh, patience. Uh, and your D factor was structure and detail. Uh, and so what they try to do is match up people to the right, um, the right personality traits. So if you are hiring an account, you want somebody that be very structured, very detail oriented, right? You don't care if they have good people skills or not because they're <laughs> sitting in a room all day, right? So he would try to match those things up. So you initially had to pass that before you could even get in the door. Uh, and it wasn't that hard. I mean, I was going for a sales job, right? So it was like, yeah, I'm aggressive. Yeah, I'm going. Yeah, I'm, you know. So, I, but it was, uh, so I passed that, interviewed with the, the Oliver group and, uh, 
and then uh, and eventually got hired. It, it was a, a thorough process. I mean, he interviewed me. He had uh, Jim Lindsay interview me with Joe Anderson. Uh, several of the people he was close to, Ed O'Daniels at the time, I had to interview with. I had to go up to parties at his house, and he wanted to see how I interacted with people. Uh, he had my wife come out. He wanted to see how she interacted with people. Wow, that is thorough. Yeah, well, she's better than me. <laughs> so, uh, so it was like a you know that was a plus, right? And uh, she really sealed the deal. for She you. did. I mean, she's. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't hire her. <laughs> so, uh, but it was it was a, a month long process. Um, and and then later we had to take a, a three day course on the predictive index. Uh, which was interesting because yeah. it t- teaches you how to deal with people. You know, if is your boss, is he detail oriented? Well, then you need to become more detail oriented in your, mm-hmm. your presentations to him or, or whatever. So yeah, I was, uh, I, I'm surprised you know about that. That's, uh, well, and also to give the, the listeners a little, uh, some of the names you dropped there, mm-hmm. uh, Jim Lindsay is basically the guy, uh, was Bill Samuel's right hand at Doe Anderson would create a lot of the uh, marketing campaigns or around uh, like the and they still do and everything still do today right? yeah yeah I mean he's like he he's like the guy like that kind of had the idea of like taking the letters that people were write writing in and uh, about their brand and and like putting them on billboards and stuff and the other one Ed O'Daniel was the former president of the uh, or executive director of the Kentucky Distillers Association and kind of now he's in the Bourbon Hall of Fame and just kind of a um, you know in the nineties he would have. I think he was the kind of he he was the guy that it you know the distillers was like he was their good old boy you know and he's still kind of around but uh, right. he's retired. and there's still a lot of O Daniels down there yeah yeah um, yeah so the, and and Lindsay when you talk about Lindsay with Doe Anderson um, he and Bill had started out you know when they were young you know when I say young probably twenties early thirties mm-hmm. and they were joined at the hip and and they were both kind of crazy and they love sticking it to. Uh, to Brown Foreman, you know, just to have some fun with them. And it was that kind of their entertainment. Um, and there was another guy at Doe Anderson named Marty Jewett. He was a creative guy. He was an absolute genius with the stuff he would do. Um, he would come out with uh, different uh, graphics that were just really interesting. He did like uh, Gulliver's Travel. He would have the Maker's Mark bottle laid down with the ropes over it and little people around it. He had uh, a big poster of... Um, um, a whale like Ahab trying to, to, um, to harpoon mm-hmm. the maker's mark bottle as it came out of the water. It was, it was really good stuff. If you, I'm sure you can Google it and find it somewhere. I mean, even today, like the stuff that comes out of there, some of those iconic advertisements that you see, I mean, yeah. it's every year they, they continue to keep, I wouldn't say push the envelope, but it's, it's very classy. It's very well done. Um, it resonates with a lot of people. Right. And so there's, there's something that they have and that they've been doing just for decades that we actually, like. we actually put up on in, in Atlanta, one of the, the big liquor stores down there, we put up an entire mural on their wall of the Ahab ad and people would come just to see it. They wouldn't even buy liquor. They would just come there to look at it. And uh, so it was, uh, Marty was an absolute genius. He always had a big um, a bowl of animal crackers that he ate all day long. <laughs> Funny guy, super guy. Somebody's got to have their energy. That's what it now, is. Now, another thing that happened during this time is that Blanton's comes out and they start taking pop shots at Maker's Mark. Right. Saying that, uh, oh, Maker's, we're sorry that you have to tell everyone about your wax because our whiskey is actually good. <laughs> you know, so right. were you a part of any of those kind of like taste offs or anything like that? And that happened in the 1990s. You know, what's interesting, you know, when you're talking about Blanton's, um, one of the reasons I think Maker's Mark rose to prominence that grew during the 90s was this whole small batch, single barrel movement, right? I mean, mm-hmm. when you go back to the mid 80s, there was um, Glenn Fittich, Glenn Levitt, and instead of paying Twelve dollars for a bottle of scotch. Now you were paying thirty dollars for a bottle of scotch, right? And the Kentucky distillers went, "Hey, I think we could do that too." And uh, Jimmy Russell came out with Blanton's, and um, Elmer T. Lee, Elmer T. Lee, yeah. Elmer T. Lee I'm yeah. sorry, came out with Blanton's, and um, Beam came out with Booker's and Baker's and Basil Hayden and Knob Creek. Um, so the, the, all of a sudden, you were having these nice small batch, and you were going from a $12 bottle of bourbon to a $30 bottle of bourbon, right? And so um, that's one of the reasons it, it, it 
there was a renewed interest in bourbon. So when you look at bourbon and its growth today, or what it's been the last, say, 10 years, I mean, really, that started back in the late 80s, early 90s with all of that. And we looked at it as we were small. I mean, we were 150,000 cases at that time, 125 to 150,000 cases from you know, like 1980 to 1990. And, and we, we were small batch and, and all these other guys were coming out going, well, we're, we're small batch. And we kind of looked at each other and we went, well, so are we, I mean, we're small, right? We're not big. 70% of maker's mark business was done in the state of Kentucky. We outsold the entire gin category in the state of Kentucky, but there was almost nothing outside the state of Kentucky, Tennessee, Southern Indiana, maybe Northern Georgia. And that was about it. Um, which surprised me when I got there that it was that regional of a brand and that growth of those small batch, single barrel, uh, the interest in the higher end bourbons is really kind of what drove our business. The other thing was Ali Domek was the owner of the brand. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mr. Samuel senior had sold it to Hiram Walker in 1981. I think, uh, Hiram Walker became it was part of Maidstone, W.A. Taylor, became eventually became Allied Lions and became Allied Domecq, which was an English-owned company, second largest liquor company in the world. They had huge brands. They had uh, Kahlua, Beef Eater, Gin, and Canadian Club. All those brands at the time were 2 million case brands. So to have Maker's Mark in your portfolio doing 150,000 cases, it's really kind of an afterthought. And they, they that's why they left Bill alone, because he could... He could do what he wanted to, and all they wanted to do was come down to the Derby every every year and party, right? <laughs> Just like, yeah, you have that thing in your portfolio. You're like, yeah, well, at least yeah. it gets me into that. At least it gets me in the Derby, <laughs> right? But those as those brands started to lose you know, their product life cycle, they, they were mature, and they were starting to lose business, and they looked at, at their portfolio and Ali Domecq, and they said, you know, where's our growth going to come from? How do we fill up the, the – how do we make up those cases that we're losing in those brands? And they looked at Sal's and Tequila and Maker's Mark and said, those are going to be our growth vehicles. And they invested heavily in those brands. So, I mean, I never had a budget. I could go spend whatever I wanted to, whenever I wanted to. I could travel anywhere. I could you know, do anything I wanted. And nobody ever came back and said, oh, you, you can't spend that money. It was mm-hmm. just, it was great. <laughs> Maybe the second best job besides <laughs> the, the merchandising rep in South Florida. <laughs> So but, talk about some of those travels and and because if you were a regional brand, yeah, where do those initial phone calls start to try and you know start breaking out of that bubble? Thanks for I mean that's interesting. So we had a guy named John Hadley down in Atlanta. John had been an old W. A. Taylor guy, an old Maker's Mark guy. He had been um, given early retirement. He was late fifties, still wanted to do some work, and so he went to Maker's Mark and said. Uh, let me represent your brand in Atlanta. He goes, I know all the the bartenders and the best places. I can, you know, get you in there. I can get those guys to recommend you. Uh, I know the top 10 uh, retail accounts. I can get you floor space. You know, I'll work your brand for you. So he went to about four different uh, companies. He had Bacardi, uh, Absolute, he had a, 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 a local Atlanta beer and Maker's Mark that he represented those four brands. His wife was a school teacher. And he represented those for years and, and he would get us into all those accounts and we really were growing really well in Atlanta. And so we were, we were talking and we went, wouldn't it be great if we had a bunch of Hadleys around the country? And so that's what we did. We ended up hiring 10 different ambassadors around the country. I was on, um, I was with my, with Barry Yonke a couple of years ago. Uh, we took a trip on, in his boat from Lake Barkley up to, to Louisville. And Barry Yonke, that name rings a bell. Barry was the brand manager. Okay. For, he works for MGP now. Okay. Uh, That's where I know the name because I think he's one of our sales reps for MGP. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he's, I mean, he lives here in Louisville and he's a super guy. So we're talking, he goes, Greg, do you remember any ambassadors be- before that? And I'm like, no, I, I don't remember any brands having ambassadors before that. He goes, Greg, I, I think we invented the ambassador program all these ambassadors you see came out of that that model and i'm like well i can't disprove that so i think <laughs> we'll, we'll take it till somebody <laughs> says till somebody says no 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 you know you're an idiot you know we'll take it so 
If anybody can disprove it, I'd like to know. Otherwise, we're claiming that we invented the ambassador program. Is it? Well, I think I think I actually even said that in one of my in one of my books. But it, you know, before that, they were just kind of like sales reps, you know. But and, you yeah. all, you all, uh, you well, all did create like an ambassador, but you didn't call them that. You actually called your consumers ambassadors. Exactly. And that's where I think, like, um, you know, when you had that conversation with somebody, it's like, oh, well, that was those was your consumer base. Right. But so, like, you had, like, this uh, really kind of a social media effort. Like, there was, like, closed networks within the Maker's Mark community that you would call ambassadors. Right. And and they were, you know, professionals. I mean, we would, we would hire them. There was two different types of people we would hire. One would be a seasoned professional, a guy who was... 60 years old, uh, had just retired, but he still wanted to be in the business. But he knew everybody in that market, right? He could get you into the best restaurants. He could get you into the, the best retail accounts. And we really focused mostly on the on-premise. The other, mo- the other type of person we had was, you know, the young, aggressive person who would work it at night. You know, they'd, they'd get out in the bars and, and, and pound it. So we had 10 of them. We had, you know, L.A., Houston, Dallas, Chicago, Miami, um, Philadelphia, DC, some different markets. And the other thing we did was uh, New York City. We really thought that trends started on the coast, whether it was New York City or it was LA or, or, or Seattle or even Miami. It, nothing, no trends start in Kansas City. You know, and so we apologies to our Kansas City yeah, listeners yeah, yeah, out there. Exactly. No offense, uh, <laughs> but hey, you all won the Super Bowl. Take it. <laughs> but um, uh, so we said we really wanted to, to be in New York City. New York City is so expensive to do to do business in, right? But we said let's. What we're going to do is we we our Empire was our distributor up there. They had seven reps on premise reps on Manhattan, and we said let's befriend those guys and really make them part of the Maker's family and work with those guys to get distribution in Manhattan. At that time, we had 18% on-premise distri- distribution in Manhattan. Uh, 18, that's one eight, not eight zero, one eight. And um, we had the seven reps, we you know had them into Louisville, uh, you know, wined them and dined them, showed them the story. I would go up there every month, uh, once a week, every month, and I would go, they would set up appointments for me. And I would I would do wait staff training, uh, and I'd do it for, you know, I, when they first got there. So, so for, from ten to noon, I'd do a couple, and then they'd have lunch hour, and then I'd do some more from say three to five. You know, four days a week I would do that, and it was great because I really didn't have a lot of hours I had to work, so I had a lot of free time up there. It's like you know I got to go to Madison Square Garden and. Yeah, the Broadway plays. And, Sounds like I got a lot of good meals in the process. Oh, yeah. great meals. I mean, unbelievable. Cigar bars were big up there at that time. I had a great time. That might have been my third best job. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was, but, and, and then those guys would like, they just embraced us. I mean, they would come down, they would just show up at Samuel's house and they'd be like, hey, we're down for the races. Can we stay at your place? And they'd be like, yeah, okay. I guess if you're here, you yeah. might as well. Well, you know, he had 16,000 square foot homes. So it's like, it wasn't like he couldn't put them up in the West Wing. <laughs> yeah. So, so they, yeah, they would come down. They they would just fly down on their own and and, and be here. And and we just, we would talk to them all the time. And, and we were really developed a, a real, it was beyond professional relationship. We became friends with those guys and they really pushed it, you know, and, and within uh, three or four years, we had, you know, over 90% distribution in New York City. I got a question when it comes to the ambassadors. Yeah. You know, how were they incentivized? I mean, was it like, you know, were they on just our, like our payroll? Ten, our 10 guys? Yeah. I mean, were they, yeah. were they on payroll or yeah. is it like, hey, you got to sell these accounts and then you get kickbacks no. or whatever? No, we, we, they had a salary uh, and it was, you know, um, it wasn't huge, but it was pretty good. They could have other jobs if they wanted to on the side. Uh, but yeah, that was, it was a paid professional position. Yeah, we we invested, you know, quite a bit in the manpower. And like I said, Ali Domek was was behind investing in the brand a hundred percent. So there was never any any pushback from them. So now you're getting ninety percent distribution in New York. I'm assuming yeah. that a lot of these cities that you have people planning in, the 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 sales are starting to increase relatively exponentially. Was, exactly. Was and, it, what and, was and you want to hit that that 
critical point, that tipping point, right? And it was like, you know, like in California, we go, if we get to 30,000 cases in California, that's the tipping point. That's where people start recognizing you, right? That unaided brand awareness. Uh, and, and that's what you're looking for is, is that kind of thing. So, and it grew. I mean, it, we were growing 12% a year and Bill had to manage that. You know, I mean, he had to manage the, because hey, whiskey, you, you, you have to lay it away for four or five, six years, right? You kind of took the next question out of my mouth is, is how do you plan for that sort of aggressive growth? Are you a private barrel club looking for total control over your own label? Or perhaps a retailer wanting low minimums on a private label bourbon that sells? Or maybe you're just a business, an organization, or charity, and you're looking to make a statement with your own gift of a barrel pick. Indiana's own Krogman's makes it super easy. Make the pilgrimage to Bloomington, Indiana, where tucked away in the old Otis Elevator factory, you can select your own barrel or barrels and discuss every detail of your bottle, from the label, the cap, and the closure, and create something truly unique. So stop putting stickers on picks and take your club to the next level. Go to krogmans.com. That's K-R-O-G-M-A-N-S dot com to learn more. Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. How do you plan for that sort of aggressive growth? Right. And so he, his, his uh, approach was 12% a year. Let's grow at 12% a year. And you're never going to hit it perfectly, right? I mean, you're either going to underproduce or overproduce. But Bill always, always said, look, he goes, whiskey distilleries go out of business when they overproduce, not when they underproduce. They, you know, they go out of business with warehouses full of whiskey. And so well, we always felt like we could, if we had to, we could, we could pull back on the age a little bit. Or we could raise the price a little bit. You know, we could play with that uh, without trying to, to hurt the quality at all. So when I got there, we were really about six years old. I mean, there's no age statement on it, right? But we were about six years old. And I think over the years, we got down to about five and a half years. Uh, but we would really not let it go below that because it just wasn't uh, it wasn't Maker's Mark, and Bill really protected the brand. Uh, a lot. Uh, Ali Domek wanted us to do line extensions all the time, and Bill was just adamantly said no. So we're going to grow the mothership before we get anywhere near line extensions. That's and that, true. that they, they didn't touch line extensions until like re very recently, two thousand eleven. But yeah. they think about that focus, that constant focus um, of just growth. I mean, that's a uh, that's the that's the key to success. So if you take a look at all these craft distillers that are coming out, they've got a gin, they got a vodka, they got a rum, they got a, they got five different lines of bourbon and they all taste like shit. You know? <laughs> right. So it's like that, that honing in on one single thing, smart. Well, and I, and Bill was really, he controlled it too. I mean, he controlled how much he would give to, to Ally Domac. I remember he came in one day, it was in uh, late November and he said, Craig, he goes, call up uh, Ali Domecq and tell them they're not getting any of our whiskey in December. He goes, daddy sold the company, but I still have the keys. <laughs> <laughs> so so kind of talk about awesome. when did that tipping point happen? Were you there to see that, to see the, you know, as you said, 30,000 cases starting in California. And then as trends started in the coast and started working their way in, like, what was, what was the, you know, what was a the tipping point? You know, be like what was the the, the feeling internally the, between people? The, the, the tipping point for me was when Maker's Mark was in the movie uh, Spider Man. I don't know if you remember that the original yeah. Spider Man movie, and they had a giant Maker's Mark bottle in there, and I was like, "We've hit it, you know, we're national now." And um, but you could see those all those markets were growing. Uh, Maker's was on fire. Uh, we were going twelve percent a year, and so. Um, between 94 and, and I left in 99 and we had gotten up to 300, 350,000 cases and, and it had really gone from being 
that Kentucky, 70% in Kentucky, to being a real nationally recognized brand. And how many original cases did you say when you were in Kentucky? Like 150,000 to... They did, they did uh, between, see, 1980 and 1990, it was always between 125 and 150,000, actually 157,000 when I got there. Uh, so they were always in that range. It was, you know, up and down, but they were always right in there every year. Uh, there was just, there was no growth on it. Uh, and they really, you know, they weren't pushing it. Bill really didn't push it that hard. I mean, he was, he was funny about it. He would go into liquor stores and if they had a display, he'd ask them to take it down because he felt it was too commercial. He wanted it, you know, the whole discovery thing. Right. So he'd like, oh no, no, take that down here. Put the bottles behind your shelf. You know, he'd be like, well, we're trying to sell this, Bill. <laughs> you're like, no, no, we want people to discover it. We don't want to be in their face with it. And how did people like like Lindsay or Doe Anderson take, you know, that sort of angle to it when they're trying to post it on billboards everywhere? Well, and, and, and they were, and, and they were doing, their advertising was fabulous. I mean, Doe Anderson did the ads and it was all, it was very... Um, proprietary advertising. So it would be stories about Bill and his family. So they would talk about um, the three great revolutionaries, uh, Lenin and Marx and Bill Samuel Sr. You know, I mean, he was, you know, how he tore up the the family recipe or the old recipe and made a new recipe. Uh, he had one ad about uh, Bill had bought a, a thoroughbred and it died. And, and the, the graphic on it was like four uh, le- horse legs sticking up in the air. I mean, it was just funny stuff. I remember somebody coming to me one time and they said, I always w- wait for the next one to come out because I want to see what it is. And he goes, it's always good. And it's always funny. So it was, it was interesting. You know, we did some other stuff too, like, um, the maker's Mark mile up at Keeneland, you know, cause we always wanted to protect Kentucky, our business in Kentucky. Cause we, we own Kentucky. I mean, when I work for Jack Daniels, I go to my friend's house and they'd be drinking makers and they'd be like, 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 dude, you know, I, I work for Jack Daniels. I'm like, we don't care. <laughs> we drink makers. And so uh, we were the second corporation to have a, a, a race at Keeneland named after us, the Maker's Mark Mile. The first was the Toyota Bluegrass Stakes. Mm-hmm. But there was a, a guy who worked for Doe Anderson named Alan Kirschenbaum. Uh, and, and he's, you know, he was this guy from, he was from New York and he studied equine uh, out at, at University of Arizona came to Kentucky. Uh, he was the editor for the Lane Report. And then he worked for Doe Anderson as their PR guy. And he was, he and Bill, they would get together and it was crazy, crazy, you know, and it would like, they, both of them are just bounce ideas off each other. Um, and so, uh, Alan actually, uh, had contacts up at Keeneland and, and got us in there and got us to do that. Alan came up with the, um, the series of bottles, the original Keeneland series of bottles. And I remember he and I were, were good friends. We were going fishing and camping up in Minnesota. We're driving up there through Warren, Wisconsin. And he goes, the third year, he goes, Greg, I got the best idea for uh, a bottle this year for the Keeneland bottle. I go, what is it? He goes, we're going to produce an empty bottle. I said, what? He goes, yeah, he's no whiskey in it. We're just going to say we don't have enough whiskey to go in it. We're just going to sell it. I said, you realize this is at a premium, right? You're going to sell an empty bottle at a premium? I go, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard, Alan. And they did it. They sold out. And it's. I think it ought to be in like the Harvard Business School case <laughs> studies, you know? Unbelievable. People, I mean, sold out, empty bottles. Yeah, those uh, those lines that come up for those like special uh, maker's bottles, they're, they're very intense. And, you know, the very first case of uh, Maker's Mark was sold to, to Keeneland. So there's like this really rich history between uh, that track and, and Maker's Mark. And, right. Uh, you know, Maker's is uh, is a brand that I think a lot of people today in the Whiskey Geek world have, have you know, lost uh, a good, you know, they don't think of it like we do other things. And that's because they will not release an an older product Mm -hmm. and it drives me crazy because i have had 10 to 12 year old maker's mark and if that was on the shelf there's very few things that could beat it in a blind competition it's incredible and like what um it's been i know it's been a while since you've been there but take us through like the conversations about the whiskey. Did you ever try to get them to say, Hey, you know what? This Buffalo Trace antique collection is coming out. Maybe we should have a 15 year old maker's mark or 
you know, well, something like, like that. Like I said, uh, you know, uh, Allied Domec push hard for line extensions, right? They always want something. We actually had a um, an inner uh, duty free. Uh, which was eight years old. It was a black label, black wax. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, man, it was the bomb. I mean, it was some good stuff. Uh, but it was only for duty free. Uh, and we never, never released it here in the US. Uh, and they tried. But again, Bill was like, he's like, look, we're telling people that we're making the best bourbon there is. And now we're going to go, oh, yeah, but there's something better. It's like, no, we're not going to do that. And, and, and I believe that 46 came out of, came out of beam, you know, I mean, when beam bought the brand, um, they, Ali Domecq owned it, but Bill had a lot of sway in Ali Domecq. He was, he was always very tight with the CEO of, of, mm-hmm. of Ali Domecq and he could be very persuasive when beam bought it. I think beam was more, this is our brand. We're going to do things the beam way. And so, you know, they, they remember they tried the, uh, to reduce the, the proof on it. Um, everybody remembers that remembers scandal. Is it a scandal? I mean, what would you uh, call the, it? the, 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 the proofing. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I worked for, um, uh, when I worked with, with Jack Daniels back in the, in the eighties, um, it, Jack Daniels used to be 90 proof when I first got to, to Brown form yeah. and they said, well, we're going to run, um, a, a test market in Wisconsin see if we can take it down to 86, see if, you know, what kind of pushback we get on it. And they did, they had like five people wrote letters complaining. They went like, well, that's nothing, right? So then they went, I think we could take it to 80 and nobody would notice or really complain. And they did. So, um, you know, there's, it, but there was no social media back then. There was no emails and, and it, I mean, it was, so nobody knew about it, right? Whereas when makers tried it, you had social media and it blew up right away. It was one of the first like, uh, you know, crazy, crazy reactions from a consumer base yeah. uh, when it came to, um, you know, the the world re- reacting. Right. And people lost their shit over it. And that was actually, I was covering that very intensely. And that was one of, um, you know, I would, you know, there's there's moments in your career where you're like, I really did that right. And I, you know, I got all kinds of exclusives on that. And mm-hmm. it was, you know, I covered that intensely. So I remember it very well. It's 2013. They lowered it from 90 proof to 84 proof. I went and bought like 10 bottles. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Still got them. Right. And you know, it's funny, like I drink it and it's like, you know, you really can notice the difference. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, they, they, I don't think we'll ever fully know the story about that. You know, because when you get when you when when I talk to Bill about it, he's always like, "Well, we we changed we we changed it, you know, because people reacted." And then people are like, "Well, maybe we know Maker's Mark, so maybe this was all a ploy just to move some cases." Yeah, you know? kind of like New Coke was back. Yeah, in, yeah, in the day. But you know, I I I I believe it was it was a Beam thing. You know, Beam is kind of the Budweiser of bourbon, right? They're kind of the low cost producer and and uh, and that's just kind of the way they operate. And I just kind of think that was a, it was a beam thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, on the topic of very, I guess you'd say like limited release bottles and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. it seems like, so we've had the Keeneland bottles now. So you're there for, you know, the start of the Keeneland extensions, but then there's always like, you know, they've been doing what when like the Lakers when you get a Lakers limited edition release, right? Um, you know, and there's always one for Kentucky. It seems every year. Were you around, or was like the first one in like '96 when they when they won the national championship? There was there was actually one before then, uh, maybe three or four years before then. They did a blue wax bottle, um, and it like sold out in no time. I mean, just boom, gone. And so yeah, I was there in '96 when the the team won the the national championship and. The blue, the, it was a white wax with a denim looking label on it because the team wore denim looking uniforms. And so we did oh, that. Oh, the, the, the style that we used to be in the That's 90s. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so it was, but that was great. And, and we got great publicity off of it. I mean, it was really well accepted. And uh, we actually donated money to uh, the Daniel Patino foundation which was rick patino's son who had passed away in infancy and he had a a charity organization for that so a good deal of the uh, proceeds went to that charity i mean and we thought 
we thought we would raise like $50,000 or something. It ended up like $250,000. I mean, it was just crazy. And um, on Friday, before the Derby, Oaks Day, we always had a big party down at Maker's Mark. And um, we had Patino come in to give him the check. So Patino came in on like a helicopter and um, there's like a thousand people down there. We had um, Kirchenbaum had to bring in um, some of the seniors, Delk and Walter McCarty and somebody, I met Mark Pope, I think. He brought those guys by car in there. And, and so they presented the uh, check to Patino up on the porch of the house. And, um, you know, bills related to Jesse James. Uh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So his, his, he's actually got a pistol. From, so. from Frank James, from Frank yeah. James. And we had to go in there a little minute. But um, so we had these guys ride up on horses dressed as cowboys, right? And they came off over the hill and they came and they held him up and took the check. <laughs> <laughs> the Samuels is always, he's always was fun like that. My wife claims that he never got to uh, celebrate Halloween because Bill always liked to dress up. You know, he was like Elvis or gangsters or whatever he's any any party he had to have a theme to it and he always loved to dress up so you know when he retired his wife threw away all of his outfits yeah was that right yeah oh his wife is the, the nicest person nancy samuels is just a beautiful person through and through what a nice lady classy lady one year um we were out there derby eve and nancy had this necklace on and diamonds i mean just dripping off of it and my wife was like oh nancy that's a beautiful necklace she goes here you wear it to the derby tomorrow and i'm like no no i don't want to be responsible for it and my wife's like yeah thanks <laughs> and i was like the whole next day i'm like freaked out about the necklace but uh she was just a nice person i mean when we had kids she had uh um, showers for us and stuff like that. And just a real people person. She's a boon from the Lebanon area. Uh, so just the, we were talking about that area before and, you know, the boons are a big family down there. So, um, yeah, so what a nice person she is. So you've had a, a lot of interaction with, with Bill Samuels over the years. It sounds like the stories are, are endless. Is there, is there one story that sticks out in your mind with Bill that is just one that memory that you'll never forget? Um, we were in, New York one time, uh, down in the meatpacking district, there was a bar down there called Coyote Ugly. Like if you go in there, I think they made a movie about it. Mm -hmm. they, did, they did. Yeah. yeah. But if you go in there they, and you were in a tie, they would just grab the tie and they had scissors and they just like snip your tie was off. You know, they, it, it was fun. The girls would get up on the, the, uh, the bar and dance every hour or something like that. We're down there and it's pretty late at night, maybe, you know, I say late, maybe 11, midnight, something like that. And Bill and I are down there and it's crowded. And Bill's standing next to this. Bill's a big guy. And Bill's standing next to this huge guy. And he inadvertently steps on the guy's foot. And the guy looks down at him real sharply. And I'm like, oh, God, no. We have to fight our way out of here, right? It's bad. And Bill looks at him. He goes, he sticks out his hand. He goes, hi, I'm Bill Samuels. And the guy was Australian. The guy goes, the bourbon guy? And he goes, yeah. And Bill had gone, uh, been on a tour like uh, a couple of months before through Australia. And the guy knew who he was. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, uh, you know, it was just typical. He was just Bill's, you know, an outgoing kind of guy and very friendly. And um, that's pretty good. I remember... Um, one time we were we were going through the 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 mill. We had a, a uh, not a hammer mill, a um, a grinding mill, I guess. And and I would dig in and take take it to show people. I'd actually dig into the flour and and show them the flour and show them how we made it. And and then I would take it would be covered with with you know the the cornmeal kind cornmeal, of yeah. yeah. And I would take it and I took it and I just hit both my my butt cheeks with my hand just to knock it off, and it made two perfect hand imprints on my butt and samuels goes well i was wrong greg can't find his ass with both hands <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he was uh i mean he was he was he was a character to work for yeah so let's kind of uh you know as we start kind of wrapping up here yeah kind of kind of push us towards the the later years so you had your 10 ambassadors you know, you were director mm -hmm. of sales and really leading the strong surge of growth of what makers really became today what was what was you know your sales force towards the end here? Like, did you have like were you 
covering like ambassadors in like 30 cities or did you just start like we just like- we just had the 10 uh and we kept that and um and ally domek had their own sales force right so ally domek had uh you know a nice size sales force. like i said they were the second largest liquor company in the world so there was probably you know a team of over 100 sales reps that they had throughout the country uh, and they would do a lot of the programming with the distributors. You know, they would do the dirty work. You know, where we would just shake hands and mm-hmm. and and get some a lot of the glory. But they were actually the guys doing you know the real day to day dirty work. You know, with distributors pricing, all that kind of thing. So um, so they pushed it, and um, you know, it just it just kept going. I mean, it just just kept going. I I eventually left. The thing Bill did, we were talking about the predictive index earlier, and Bill always hired high A's, guys who were aggressive, wanted to do things their way, that kind of thing. I mean, we would have five guys in the room and everybody wanted to do something different. We had a hard time, you know, deciding where to go to lunch half the time, you know, because everybody thought they wanted to, you know, I want to go here, I want to go here, I want to go here, you know. So, but at the end, um, you know, those guys, we were there for, you know, maybe five years and, and people started going, okay, what's, what's my next step? You know, where am I going with my career? I'm 40 years old. Where am I going? See, Bill's dad had a team in place until, until about 1990. Uh, Glenn Jaworski was the, the finance guy. We had, uh, um, uh, um, you know, marketing, sales, production, you know, and, and Bill hired his own team. You know, he hired Pickerel, he hired me, he hired uh, Yonke, um, David Salmon was part of the team. Uh, so we had, you know, four or five guys there, Mitch uh, Wagner, who was the CFO. And we were all, you know, 35 years old. And 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 after about five years there, we started going like, well, okay, what's, what's my next step? You know, we've worked on this brand and we've built it nationally. And, you know, where's, where's the payoff for that, you know? And so we one by one started to leave to go do other jobs, uh, and and just uh, within the company most of the time, you know, to within Ally Domec where you were in a bigger because his triangle was you know it was Bill and 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 us, mm-hmm. you know, there's nowhere to go. And then Rob had just joined the company not long, you know, b- before that. Um, I mean, when I got there, he was at University of South Carolina. He was just a student, just a kid, nice kid, nice guy, still is a great guy today. Um, but, you know, eventually it was like, okay, where am I going to go? Am I going to do this for the next 25 years or am I going to, you know, take the next step in my career? So eventually we started leaving one by one. And I think uh, Mitch is the only guy that's that's still there now, the CFO. And so let's, uh, you know, as we start wrapping up here, I kind of want to give mm-hmm. a plug for, you know, what you do today, because you, we Thanks. talked beforehand is that, you know, you are 17 years now into your own business and kind of talk about what you do and what kind of, you know, how you help brands sort of go when, to that next step. When I left Makers, I went to work for Ally Domec, the, the parent company, and I went into an area which is called on-premise national accounts, which is restaurant chains and hotel chains. Um, and so uh, over the next couple of years, I, de- I had a lot, I developed a lot of relationships in those, in the, in that, that little market segment. Um, on-premise national accounts does about, oh, about 35% of all on-premise business is done by the chains. But, um, so I went in there and I did that. Um, and I ended up, uh, when, when Ally Domecq got sold to Pernod Ricard, I was without a job. Um, one of the old, uh, presidents at, at Ally Domecq, went to work for Svedka Vodka. They were doing 200,000 cases at that time. Their office was about the size of, of your bar right here. I mean, it was tiny. It was in Manhattan on, on Madison Avenue. And so the, Bob said, uh, why don't you come do on-premise national accounts for us? And he goes, we can't hire you full-time because we're not doing enough volume, but you can be a consultant. And I said, I, you know, I need a job. I had two kids and you know a wife and there. We need the job. So I, I I said, yeah, I'll do that. And then I was talking to David Salmon, who I work with at, at Ally Domac or with Makers. And he had gone to work for Mac Shapira and was doing a brand called Hypnotic. Uh, I don't know if you remember Hypnotic. It was, it's still around. The, so, yeah. the, yeah, it's still around, right. And, <laughs> and I mean, I'm just thinking of a rave or something, you know. Like, <laughs> David kept telling me how good the brand's doing. I'm like, oh, David's full of it, you know. And, but, and I checked in, I was like, oh, David's not full of it. This brand is really doing well. It's almost half a million cases. So I started doing 
Heaven Hill, they became my largest client. And then I did, uh, Jim Lindsay had retired from Doe and he was doing a brand called Schmidt's Own Wines out of Germany, Riesling Wines out of Germany. He said, I heard you know, David told me what you're doing. Would you come do it for, for Schmidt's Own? So I had three clients and I was making about as much money as I was, you know, working for Maker's Mark or those companies. And Maker's came back to me. I'd only been out of there for 10 months. They said, come back, you're grandfathered in, you know, you get your vacation time, all that. And I said, you know, I've I got this thing going and um, it, it, the ball's teed up. You know, if I'm ever going to go to work for myself, this is my chance. So I said, I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice and see if I can do this, make this work. And so um, I've been doing this for 17 years now. I help smaller suppliers uh, get into on-premise national accounts. Uh, there are people who are so small, they can't afford a full-time on-premise national accounts rep, but they can uh, cost share. And so uh, I did uh, Svedka, did Heaven Hill for nine years with, you know, Evan Williams and the launch of Luna Azul. Um, I did um, St. Germain, uh, Elder, Elder Flower Liqueur. Um, his brother had a brand called um, Domaine de Canton, Ginger Liqueur, which Heaven Hill ended up buying. I did that brand. Uh, Kenny Chesney's Blue Chair Bay Rum. I did Q Drinks, the mixer. I did did for them. So, you know, Angel's Envy was a brand I helped uh, launch in on-premise national accounts. So, you know, I've had some nice successes. And if they're really good, they get bought by bigger companies and move on. And then I find the next guy coming up. And, you know, it's interesting. I've got a brand right now called Sagamore Rye. Which oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So Sagamore's out of Baltimore. The owner of it is a guy named Kevin Plank, who owns yeah. Under Armour, mm -hmm. right? So um, um, he keeps the business separate. But, um, you know, I'm only, uh, I report to, uh, to Tom, who reports to Brian, who reports to Kevin. So I'm only three guys down from Kevin Plank. You know, that's <laughs> pretty. So, pretty cool story. Hey, I'm just waiting for my free Under Armour stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if you do your job well enough, they'll send you a shirt. Right, right, right. So so now I do um, Four Roses, uh, Casa Dragani's uh, Tequila, um, Garrison Brothers Bourbon, uh, Maison Ferran, which is uh, Pierre Ferran, Dry Curacao, and Plantation Rum. Um, I've got uh, Van Gogh Vodka is, is, um, a company I work with. So I've got about 11 different, uh, 10, 11 different clients right now. Awesome. And yeah. now I know that when we were first started talking that if there's people that are out there that own brands and you think you want to get into national distribution of chains, make sure you're in at least like 30 States before you, you contact Greg. Yeah. You know, if I go to like Bonefish Grill or, or Texas Roadhouse or who, whoever it is, you know, they've got, they've got to be in all those markets, right? So if you get around 35 cases, 35 states, we'll, we'll fit you in somehow. We'll shoehorn you in. Well, awesome. Well, Greg, yeah. I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. I think it was, as, it's always fun to hear stories of like, I want to say the good old days, but you know, like the, the days when, you know, before a business really starts blowing up mm -hmm. and you kind of get to see the startup mentality. I wanted to be able to tell you the story of, of how it went from a small regional brand to a national brand, yeah, you know, and that's, you know, kind of the, what I was trying to, the well, story I wanted to convey. And the, the, you know, and I've done, I've probably written about and studied Maker's Mark's history more than most brands. And you just gave me, you gave me a little detail that I didn't even know. And mm -hmm. that was uh, Bill going in and shutting down, you know, display cases. Right. And, it, and it's just so Bill Samuel. That's right. It makes so much you sense. You can see him doing it, right? You can see him doing it. Right. Because like he's, you know, he just had like this, this psychology of like what, what people wanted. Right. And, and I think when he, he's still involved in the, in makers and he's still involved in the bourbon industry. But I, I would love to see, I would love to have Bill Samuels in his prime, like right now, mm -hmm. you know, kind of guiding the, sh the, the ship of, of all whiskey because- You know, it's really interesting because Bill always wanted to help bourbon. Exactly. Not just Maker's Mark, because he always felt like what's good for bourbon is always going to be good for Maker's Mark, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that when they built Woodford Reserve, he went down there and helped them a lot with that. I mean, he said, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, and look, hey, we did this, and here's a mistake we made, don't make this mistake. I mean, he felt like um, the rising tide raises all the ships. And so the was, irony of that is that they built Woodford Reserve to get Maker's Mark off Jack Daniels back. 
Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it was it, it, Woodford was like the first brand they said, we don't yeah. have to have a, a 15% return on investment on. We're going to look at the long term mm. this thing. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, like I said, this was just, it was a really great story and you definitely conveyed it and you definitely were able to share some great stories about Bill. I think he's just one of those characters in bourbon that right. it's, it's unmatchable. He's the greatest when it he's, comes to the showmanship. Of he it. was so full of energy yeah. and uh, was such an ambassador for bourbon itself ac- uh, around the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, Greg, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. If there's any way that brands want to reach out to you, is mm-hmm. there a website or something they should go and, and do or email? I'm, I'm at uh, www.bmo corporations beverage management outsourcing bmo and then the whole word corporation.com awesome well greg yeah. thank you for coming on and make sure you follow bourbon pursuit wherever you get your podcast you can also find all of our podcasts at bourbonpursuit.com they're even listed by category so if you want to find things to be a by master distiller or by bourbon 101 you can do that as well and if you like the show you want to support the show you can do so at patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit Fred, thank you again for coming on today. Thank always. You shared some some great insight as well into Maker's Mark. It's always great to have your your knowledge base here to uh, shed those little, little pieces of knowledge too. Absolutes. So with that, cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all cheers. next week. Cheers.